There he is. All right. There, yeah. Hello, everyone. Is my screen already showing? Yes, it is. All right. Well, we are the Dutch US team. And uh, of course, we want to see the Rhino alive. And then uh, we will talk about how we want to uh, achieve that uh, in this coming hour. Um, if there are any questions, just ask them, and uh, Aliyah will ask them to me. And then uh, we can answer them right away. And at the end, of course, there will also be some uh, room for discussion. Excellent. Yeah, so of course, we, uh, we've we just come back uh, from South Africa, and uh, we've made a nice video, which you can see on our website. And uh, we will talk about that today as well. And there's also a little surprise in there for you. But uh, the content of today, uh, we start with our motivation for this project, uh, explain how our, uh, our system is set up right now, uh, and of course our trip to South Africa, and we finish with our partners. In between, I will give the words to uh, Anouk, who is going to talk about uh, the automatic detection and our interface, and then Camille will talk about our trip. So yeah, for me, my uh, motivation comes from uh, 25 years ago when I was born in Botswana. And uh, I, I lived there and saw rhinos in the wild, which is amazing to see. And uh, you really need to see something like this to, to, uh, to know what it means to you. And I think by now the rest of our team uh, can feel the same. And um, yeah, we are in South Africa with six of us. There are two more uh, in the Netherlands, and we uh, just got a new uh, support uh, just now. So we're at nine in total, and we are from uh, different universities in the Netherlands, uh, both from Delft and Amsterdam. And uh, combining these universities, we have got uh, the skills from uh, aerospace engineering, artificial intelligence, and electrical engineering. And there are the main those are the main parts that are important for designing this UAV to help save the Rhino. Of course, we also got this news uh, that the Rhino is being poached, and the even worse news that is escalating at this, this increasing amount of, of Rhinos poached every year. And uh, this year, this, re this record is even uh, is, is already broken. So it's, it's really clear that it ha this has to happen now. Uh, it's also good that this challenge is there because this gave us the chance to, uh, to really start working on this. Our uh, operations involve uh, are set up around that the ranger is working in, a, in this big park that is way too big to cover on foot. Uh, we always compare Kruger National Park with the Netherlands. It's actually half the size of our country. And there are only 500 people over there that can actually, are actually working on the protection. So he has a pretty difficult job. That's why we want to give him eyes in the sky to make sure that he can find the rhino and the poacher in time before anything happens. And of course, uh, the system has to work completely autonomous such that the ranger doesn't have to do any finding, but he can only focus on the protecting. We uh, have a quite nice, uh, I think, uh, philosophy in our work, and which is also uh, the way to go for us right now, is that we want to make sure that uh, everything we do, fly it as fast as possible, take it up in the air, and any problems that you encounter, try to fix them only when you, you start working on getting it to fly. And only then start working on improving the idea and designing further. Because we also believe that there are way too many uncertainties right now to actually do a detailed um, detailed design. So we uh, actually work from uncertainty to uncertainty and try to fix, or get the answer to that question and then we, need, we know uh, what our next step can be. And this year there was uh, the automatic detection uh, flying in South Africa and what does a ranger really need? Uh, a lot of these answers we actually, uh, well, partly solved in uh, South Africa. And uh, well, the answers we will share later in this presentation. Let me introduce uh, our setup with you. 
we've got, of course, uh, an aircraft, our safety pilot, and uh, well, you can see uh, a lot of laptops. This is how we actually started testing in, in Belgevonden in South Africa uh, two weeks ago. And during the week, we uh, well, reduced the size of this, uh, <laughs> this setup a bit, which is partly because some of our systems actually uh, start, stopped working. So we got our twin star over here. It's our aircraft. We've got another one lying here, so we've got two with us. The safety pilot, a ground oper operator with ground station, and a laptop with automatic detection and a ranger interface. And those three laptops are connected via uh, a network uh, interface. And this uh, laptop is connected with the telemetry of the aircraft. And this one has, uh, is connected with the FPV setup of this aircraft. Uh, of course, not very mobile yet, but uh, it's enough to, to test our main assumptions, like can a ranger uh, work with this interface and trigger the questions that he is going to ask us. And that gives us the chance to know what we need to focus on next, uh, the next step. Then, of course, you want to know about the aircraft. So we brought two twin stars with us in uh, South Africa. Very easy to fly aircraft, not very big, uh, can also not carry a lot, but enough for now. Um, so it's 1,400 millimeters in span, and we flew it with a, a weight up to uh, 1.7 kilograms. With this configuration, it's only 30 minutes of flight time flying at 70 meters per second. We did most of our testing between the 50 and 125 meters. And we flew it, fly with a Paparazzi autopilot. And most of our camera images are now with a GoPro. If there are any details that you're missing, please ask them. And I can share them as well. Uh, and we've got three wireless communications set up in this aircraft. The, the radio control, telemetry, and a first person view for a live video. If there are no questions up to now, I don't think so. Then I would like to invite uh, Anouk to explain how our automatic detections uh, work. Can someone uh, unmute Anouk? I have a question. How many flights did you guys do when you were in South Africa for this game reserve? Uh, more than 30. Did you guys do a night flight? And, well? yeah, more than 30. 30 flights. We did one time a night flight Okay. to check um, if we can see anything at night. I think Camille will answer that question later. Okay. Uh, can one of you, Camille or Alia, uh, invite Anouk to Anouk Fisher? Yeah. Hi Anouk, you're on mute, so if you can unmute your mic. Okay, so, so how high were you? Oh, there you are. Okay, yes. We can hear you. Yeah, but, uh, there was a question, I believe. Uh, no, there weren't any questions. Okay. <laughs> we'll just wait okay. for the presentation. All right. Um, so I'm Anouk. I work on computer vision of our drone. Um, we use computer vision so that mostly we can focus the attention of the ranger on the right uh, parts of the image. So what we see here is um, our aircraft flying over the rhinos and what we want to achieve is that all rhinos are captured within one bounding box. Um, so we want to do this to focus attention but also to reduce the data. So imagine that this is running on board of the aircraft. It, you can reduce the data very much by just only sending the boxes that contain something interesting. Uh, so we build a system uh, that works by learning to recognize a rhino 
uh, or whatever you wanted to recognize compared to the landscape. It's a learning system that needs a lot of examples. Um, and at this moment, it just recognizes objects, just general objects. Whatever you put in, it can recognize in the end. Um, in the future, we will also work on a classifier uh, so that we do not only get a box, but also a label uh, accompanying the box saying that what, whatever is in the box. Um, so we have a few examples. Can someone go to the next uh, slide? Anu, how, how high were you flying for that okay. particular, um, uh, I guess, that particular picture that you took from the air? How, far, how high were you guys flying? Uh, the, the picture we just saw? Yeah, the one before. Uh, 100 meters. I'm sorry. Approximately. 100 approximately 100 meters. Okay. Yes. Uh, so is this picture, I think. Um, so this picture was taken in Welgevonde uh, with a GoPro. And there are five rhinos on the bottom of the screen. Uh, so we trained our system by um, giving a few examples. So what we do is we draw bound bounding boxes about, around the rhinos themselves. Um, and then in the end, the system can make a prediction of where it thinks the rhinos are. Um, we have this as well. Next slide, please. <laughs> yes, so here we see that the system detects the rhinos um, and something around the tree. It's not perfect, but at least all five rhinos are in the box, and there may be one or two false positives left. Um, we have another example. Uh, so at another location in Welgevonde, we did another test. Um, there are many cars in this picture. Uh, maybe we can get up the detections of the system. Yes, so here we see that uh, all three cars are in the bounding box. There's one car uh, sort of hidden under three on the left and two cars on the top right. Um, at the uh, top of the picture we see a lot of false positive boxes, so boxes that do not contain anything. Um, this is mostly because at this moment the model was not trained to recognize that, that landscape as not an object. So basically what our system learns is um, not really what an object looks like, but mostly it learns to recognize the landscape not as an object. But this is some, pon some part of the landscape in Welgevonde that it didn't see yet, so there are some false positives. Um, what's uh, slightly more disturbing is that in, on the bottom right of the image there are three people. Um, they are so small that you can barely see them, and also the system misses them. Um, so we're trying, we're testing on different uh, altitudes and different resolutions to see how we can make the system find these people. Okay, so um, our system is a learning system and it needs a lot of examples for optimal performance. Um, so far in the Netherlands we've been testing on cows in a meadow, um, which is nice. Um, but of course a cow is very different from a uh, rhino, so we needed a good data set. So in South Africa we created a data set, a pretty big one. Um, we have not yet annotated every single image in that data set. Um, at this point we have 577 annotated images of rhinos, zebras, rangers and cars. Um, we have more images of also hippos and elephants, uh, which still need to be annotated. Um, and what we would like to announce today is to share this data set with you. Um, so we want to save the rhino and we believe that sharing our data set is important if we want to succeed with this. Um, so that's why you can download our data set today. It's the annotated data set. There's instructions on the website. Uh, you can find it at savetherhino.nl slash dataset. And we hope that you can do something good with it. Okay, so. Yes, and we would like to invite you to all share your data as well, because this would be really helpful for our system and also for your systems, because I assume most of you will be making learning systems. Um, we need a lot of data to, to be able to make accurate predictions of where the rhinos are in these images of the landscape. Anouk, um, there's a question from Mike, uh, and it was on the duration of the flight time. Is it 30 minutes for this particular aircraft you took? Uh, yes, for this one it is. We can include more batteries, and we might uh, go up to an hour. Um, and then his second question is, is it fully autonomous? Um, it can be fully autonomous, um, but at some points we needed to take over. We have the, the pilot we saw in the picture a few slides back. Um, so we always have a safe, a field safe, which is Kitso standing in the, yes. standing by. With his so, so, coach. So we, manu 
we, we manually launch the aircraft and, uh, and manually land the aircraft in our tests, but we are able to, uh, we are working on to make that autonomous as well. Hey, so for right now, you haven't done any autonomous um, uh, launch and recovery? Uh, not in South Africa. Okay. Yes, more questions? Um, I think that's it for right now. Okay, so let's move on to another part of the system. Um, so of course we can give the ranger, we can give him a video stream, um, but that doesn't really offer much context of where we are flying and what we're seeing. Uh, so in addition to uh, detections and the video stream, we also um, design an interface, the ranger interface. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot more context to this interface. Um, it's basically a big map. Uh, you can see the location of the aircraft, which is the orange circle in the top right. Um, and also you can see a blue bounding box around the orange dot, which is the field of view. So that's what we're actually seeing in the, uh, in the real time stream. Um, also, we can include icons of things like poachers, rangers, uh, and rhinos, or maybe multiple aircraft to just give more information inside the map. Um, this can also, of course, be linked to the computer vision system so that you don't have to place the icons yourself, but they'll be generated automatically. And on top of that, we also include the video stream in the ranger interface. So now Camille, I think, is going to tell something about our tests in Africa. Uh, Camille, and I think you might yes. be the right person for this question too. Um, did you only have like you you only had a GoPro camera on, on, or did you guys use so other cameras as well? We 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 also used an F FPV camera uh, on board. Um, uh, it's less quality, but it was like real time uh, data. Uh, but it kind of uh, degraded over time uh, during our tests, so it didn't make the end of uh, our tests. So most of our data in the data set, or all the data, I think, uh, yeah, all the data is from the GoPro, taken by the GoPro. Um, what about the temperature? What kind of temperature did you guys see while you were there? And you were there for one or two weeks? We were there for two weeks. Okay. Uh, temperatures, uh, well, the weather kind of uh, differed, so uh, we had days of 30 degrees, so uh, we, we most of our uh, stay we uh, stayed in uh, uh, in Waterberg region, so at the Welgevonde Game Reserve. But we also went to Kruger, which is a thousand meter lower, so it's like 500 above uh, the sea level. And in in Kruger, it was a lot of it was warmer. It was like 30 degrees. Uh, it was very humid. But uh, during our stay, it was uh, also raining and thundering. They have big thunderstorms there as well. In the Waterberg region, um, well, the, the weather was uh, um, it was quite similar. Or yeah, it was a bit warmer than yeah the Netherlands. But yeah, the Netherlands doesn't is, uh, isn't very good reference. So it's it's it's. Uh, uh, it's it's the water season there, so so it really differs. It can be very cold at night, uh -huh. but it's very warm during the day. And if if it's not cloudy, it can be can be going up to thirty degrees. Uh, and uh, it's very intensive to test in when it's very sunny. Yeah. Uh, well, when it's cloudy, uh, it's 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 a bit chilly. It's between twenty degrees. Uh, or so, because um, one of the things that we we saw when we were in Kruger testing last year, um, the temperature in a week period went. The lowest we saw was like fourteen, I think, degrees Celsius, and then the highest was like thirty eight degrees Celsius in like a five or six day period. So it, from my from my opinion, I think it varies drastically. And uh, my question to you is, how did your um, aircraft but also the components within the avionics. How did they respond, especially the imaging, um, for for your flights? Did that affect at all? So, so uh, regarding the avionics, I would like to invite uh, Kitsu to answer the question, and uh, I will answer the question about uh, the the uh, the camera. So, lightning uh, is very very important. I will show some images in a bit. When it's cloudy, uh, when it's when it's uh, not cloudy uh, and the sun is shining fully, you have very nice shadows, very bright, and um, 
but when it's cloudy, you don't have these shadows. And these shadows make it very easy, or at least for the human eye, uh, already to detect humans uh, and, and rhinos and other kind of uh, objects you want, you're looking for. Uh, when it's cloudy, you don't have that shadow anymore, and it's yeah, it's it's easier when when there is a shadow, I would say. Kitsou, can you answer the other question? Yeah, regarding the, the temperature in our system, I think our aircraft didn't really uh, notice the the temperature. There was no real problem uh, at that point, but uh, one of our laptops overheated uh, a couple of times uh, in the full sun, so we had to uh, restart it take it into the shade and then it, it worked again. But um, the, when the aircraft is flying, it, it, it feels a lot of wind, so I think there's no problem there. If it's lying on the ground, it might, but uh, the real problem was with the laptop. Very good. Um, and there's a question from Mike again, um, and his question is, Do you were you able to do live stream um, uh, videos? We started the week uh, uh, with a first-person view camera and a live stream. Um, the quality of the camera degraded during the week uh, up to almost nothing, so we uh, we uh, took it out and uh, started just filming with our GoPro. Because the, then we just uh, record the, the, the high-quality video and then you've got a basis to start with from your with your uh, vision software. And uh, the first-person view camera was almost nothing anymore, in the end. Uh, Kitsu, can you give me access to your screen so I can move the presentation? Yes. Are, are there any more questions? Not right now. So we'll go on with your presentation. Oh. So, uh, so we went. Uh, I will tell a little bit more about our test in South Africa. So, yeah, we went there on a threefold uh, mission. Uh, uh, we had three things in mind when before going there, and one was to test our basic system. How would it react against uh, the weather there? So, uh, how would it do uh, against the heavy winds? The winds can turn very fast there, and our system was able to to deal with that. Uh, and uh, I think it. I think at most it flew uh, nearly up to 90 kilometers per hour when the wind was in the back. Uh, but uh, Kitsou can more knows more about that. Um, and uh, another reason what we wanted to test because we didn't know what if it was going to work uh, was our computer vision algorithms. And uh, yeah, our first results uh, we have uh, uh, what what Anouk already told you is that that it's doable. It's able to detect uh, objects of interest like cars, rangers, uh, humans, I mean, um, uh, rhinos and other animals. So and um, yeah, we also tested the performance of the camera at night because uh, the moon there is very, very bright. You can, if, if it's full moon, you can see your full shadow there on the ground uh, with, with, your, with your eyes and uh, we wanted to test uh, uh, whether our normal camera would be able to uh, to do anything, and we recorded uh, a small uh, a small flight, but in the end uh, there was nothing to be seen on the videos, only black you, images. So, Camille, were you guys there during a full moon period then? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, there, yeah, and we flew uh, uh, like uh, a night flight during like uh, the evening. But you made a good or, point. Like on the ground, you could clearly see with a full moon. Yes, yes, but our the camera we use, so the GoPro camera uh, doesn't see anything. No, no, but I'm talking about like let's say as for yeah. poachers, if they're going out there, it would make a lot of sense. Why now? Because you yeah. were there personally to see it yourself, you could actually see the animals yeah. with a full. Yeah, basically we uh, before because there is some time before the moon comes up and the sun uh, uh, when when the sun is already down. So then it's first it's fully dark and uh, then you can see almost nothing. But then after when the moon is going up, it's becoming brighter and brighter and brighter. And you can see like when first you didn't see anything on the field, then you can look like like to the other side of the field. It's it's really amazing that moon gives like a lot of light uh, uh, on the floor. Uh, so we so so definitely it will help if we have light sensitive cameras uh, on board in the in the in the future. Great, thank you. 
so so the second thing we we went there was actually to test uh, test our assumptions we had about uh, about the rangers and that we did we did in collaboration with the rangers and also with the uh, with the management of the of the rangers and one thing uh, we we found out is that uh, corruption is one thing uh, they they they're thinking of is really important we can give a a um, a drone to to a ranger, but we want the the head ranger or the uh, person in uh, in uh, uh, responsible for the, for the anti poaching of the park wants to also be able to check that. So they don't want to give the the ranger uh, the the opportunity to to uh, to misuse uh, the drone for other purposes. So for example, a ranger is sitting on a mountain and he has access to this drone. So at the moment he's just watching his field in front of him. Um, uh, in Baderberg you have a lot of mountains, so that's why they sit on mountains. You don't have that in Kruger, of course. But in, in that case, they uh, they they are responsible. If something goes wrong, they are responsible, held responsible if there's something goes wrong. But if they have this drone and fly it uh, in the back and say and uh, yeah, they don't pay attention to the screen or something, or they they can easily say. Oh, uh, to someone, there's a rhino there, and and they get their their part of the big pie. They can get for the horn, of course. So, uh, so to prevent that, they want uh, they want to use or they want to be able to check, really check whether uh, the stream as well. So they want this stream also at the central point in the park, so they can uh, react uh, uh, because all the decisions are made by the the head of anti poaching. So uh, and if if if, if false uh, or misinformation is given to him, uh, uh, yeah, a, a tragedy can uh, can can happen, of course, and uh, a, a random might die. So they really really want a a corrupt proof uh, system. So uh, so that's what they pointed out was really important. I think we we thought they uh, they found important as well, but actually they didn't. Was that, uh, or I think, was an, an issue. So the negative things of open source. So the other people are uh, able to see what you're built, but they're not really worried uh, about that because uh, why? Because a drone is much more expensive to to uh, to buy or and to operate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, than to buy a game drive to the park and see where the rhinos are. So they are not really worried of. Uh, poachers using using uh, using a drone um, because because uh, it's much cheaper to just book a game drive at a safari and then you know also where the rhinos are. So why would you put in uh, much more money? So so they were quite open for that for for open source. So that was a very uh, very insightful thing. We thought was uh, yeah we thought that the the negative things of open source or the the downside of open source. Would uh, bother them, but that was not the case. And so the last thing we went there for was uh, business development to see whether they actually want the systems. So and and you know, uh, parks are, or we thought parks would be very skeptical, and uh, there's a reason for that. But I will go into that a little later. Um, so they are very interested in anti poaching purposes, so uh, to to do anti poaching uh, missions, but they are also interested. In other uh, conservation tasks, so uh, things like uh, counting animals, game counts. Every year, every park in Africa, but also around the world, has to do a game count of their big animals, and uh, they are now doing that with a helicopter. So, in the future, that would be would would also be an opportunity to to use to use a drone for that. Another thing is mapping uh, and other conservational tasks uh, you can imagine because biologists are, find it very interesting to get their sensors by another way in the park. So, so why, why are these parks kept? Can I ask you a question? Um, actually, it's not my question. Astrid has a question about um, during nighttime testing, did you test with heat sensitive camera for animals or poachers or would that not be appropriate for your project? Um, so we weren't able to take a camera uh, or a, a heat camera to uh, um, to South Africa because of the because it's a military system, I believe, um, and that's why we didn't brought one. But it's definitely 
uh, open to be considered the next time. Uh, and even during uh, daytime, it would be very useful to use it because uh, you're able to see it or you're able to see animals depending on the heat of the, of the background, of course. Now, during the counter poaching games, we will have the FLIR Tau 640 available for the teams to use during the night flights because for the counter poaching games, they have to do daytime flights as well as night flights. So we'll provide that camera because we'll get the approvals and get it out there for the teams to test. Um, but yeah, I, I think, think that was a uh, that's restrictive at times. I think uh, we are also able to test with it in the Netherlands. Uh, Kitso, uh, we have one, right? Yeah, we can borrow one from one of our sponsors. So uh, I think we can test it in the Netherlands and then we can be pretty sure to use the, the one that's available in South Africa. That would be really great. Okay, thank you, uh, Kitso. Are there any other questions? Not yet. Okay. So, so why are these comp or why are these parks skeptical about all these drone companies? Well, because first of all, uh, all these companies think they they uh, invented the thing, uh, the, the the great idea, the big act in in their country, and then they come to South Africa or some other country that has uh, a nice uh, uh, animals, and uh, they show it off and and they, they put a price on it. And uh, most of uh, most of uh, most of the times, it's not finished because uh, well, they think it's finished, but it's not because a park uh, isn't able to use it yet because they need training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a big price tag on that. So that's really something you should uh, consider uh, before uh, offering something to to parks there. And that's one of the reasons why parks are skeptical um, because also because. Uh, uh, they they don't have the manpower to to uh, if if your solution doesn't scale uh, they don't have the manpower to operate they they don't want to lose like ten people to operate five drones for them and uh, yeah well uh, so it should really be scalable and um, yeah that, that that's that's our a couple of things we we noticed there and uh, and um, in the way we approached uh, the, 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 the parks there, uh, we were very open to talk about everything. And uh, yeah, they, they, they are very interested and, uh, and they are willing to work with us if, if, you're, if you're open for it. Um, Camille, there is a question. Um, yeah. Can you please tell me what exactly are you using to differentiate between a rhino and a human? For your image or, or automatic detection. So, so like Anouk told already, I think is that our system is not really uh, already. It's it's an object detector at the moment, so it's just uh, finding interesting objects, and we're working on a classifier that's able to classify these objects. Um, I, Anouk, I don't know if you have any ideas already on how you're gonna solve that challenge. Anouk still oh, yes. here? Am I, am I? Yes, you're on. Yes, okay. Um, so we're going for fissure kernels, probably. It looks a bit like back of words, so we basically assume that um, a rhino has certain parts that an elephant has not. Um, and we can uh, train a classifier to recognize uh, an elephant or a classifier, or an elephant or a rhino, just based on these really small local features. Um, but we're thinking about future kernels at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Anouk. Are there any other questions, Ali? Yeah. Um, so, Persant has this uh, has another question, and it's about thermal. Um, and I know you guys didn't use thermal during your uh, trip to South Africa, but his question is, um, are you using thermal cameras and checking HSV values? Um, I don't know if you've tested at all in Netherlands or not, but if you will be testing it, are you going to be uh, checking for those values? Uh, we 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 did some tests in a zoo in the Netherlands where we also had a, a heat camera, I believe. Um, yes, I I really have to refer this question again to Anouk. Is she there? Um, yeah, at the moment we're just using RGB. Did you hear what I said? At the moment we're just using RGB. We have some thermal images. 
um, yeah, we can use HSV. Um, we're not working in RGB strictly. We're working in a different color space. Um, and HSV is just a, another color space, um, which we didn't test. Um, at this moment, we tested opponent color space and normalized RGB and, of course, just the intensity image. And and you saw that it really helps, right, uh, to change color spaces. Yeah, uh, so for, things. especially in the Sioux in the Netherlands, um, using the, the grayscale image doesn't give you much information, but using normalized RGB really helps. Um, and the same holds true for Africa, uh, but there the difference is less extreme. Um, but we're switching color spaces cons constantly to just find the optimal configuration. Um, and it may not be the same for every different situation, of course. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, that's it. Thank you, uh, Anouk. Thank you, Anouk. All right. Do you? Uh, sorry, Kamal. Next do you want slide, to please. Yeah, I think you're. Oh. Okay. Oh, hi, Steve. Glad you could join us. Hi, guys. Yeah, no, it's just uh, usual stories in Africa. <laughs> Eskom <laughs> has just uh, cut the power off to half of Janusburg. Oh, geez. Okay. So you're sitting That's in your car, so thank you for joining us. <laughs> Great. Hi, Camille. Hey, good to see you hey, again. Hey, Steve. Yeah, good to see you too. So that's one thing we wanted to touch upon. Uh, Kit, so can you put next slide because I don't have control anymore. Um, uh, Camille? Ja, de presentatie even overnemen. Mijn computer is wel even uitgevallen. Oh, uh, oké. Okay. Okay. Alia, can you make me a presenter? Yes, I can make you a presenter. Thanks. All right, there you go. Oké. Okay. Oh. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, it's coming up and well, uh, Denzel has a question. What were some of your team's challenges to do the tri trial in Kruger Park? Logistics permissions travel. Challenges. Um, wait one second. I will. Uh, yeah. uh, challenges uh, to, to travel there. Um, um, logistics and well, getting the permission to fly in these different places or in Kruger specifically. Okay, so at the moment um, to, to fly, uh, to, to transport our stuff there, uh, we we just bought like special uh, suitcases uh, to, to uh, transport it uh, via the plane. Uh, we didn't have any issues during our travels to South Africa. The only thing that stopped us a little bit at the customs or the, 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 the checks is uh, the li lipo batteries. They want to look at them, uh, they want to feel them, but then they give them back. Um, to test in Kruger and uh, to test in, in the Waterberg region, uh, we didn't really have problems there because we had uh, good contacts there uh, that uh, were inviting us and um, uh, yeah, uh, invited us to, to, show, uh, to show our system. But yes, at the moment it's it's forbidden to fly as a as a company. But uh, we we uh, flew there as a model aircraft. Does that answer the question, Denzel? If you yeah. have any follow up questions to that, go ahead and um, just type them in. And he said yes, that answered his question. So thank you. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. So. Um, so, well, uh, Steve already touched upon some of our lesson, lessons. Power is not something you can rely on in, in Africa. So really think of your, your operations there. Um, it, it, because power or internet is, is not a given. Uh, sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't have it, and you're really dependent on it. And um, sometimes uh, we had to charge our laptops via, via a car and Think of those kind of things uh, so, so your operation go easy so that you're not that dependent on power or internet. You, you need it, but uh, make, make, make it so that uh, you're, you're less dependent on it or that you have enough of it. Um, 
So another thing we, we, we noticed is that there is a, like a diverse uh, landscape. So on the one hand, you have like these big uh, open, uh, open uh, fields. And on the other hand, you have uh, like uh, 100 meters further, you have like a mountain or a hill going up like 100 meters. And it's going up and down, up and down. So, so that's really diverse. And in, in some, some regions, you have a lot of trees. And in others, you just have lots of grass. So, so it's really, so it's really differing, uh, different. And yes, of course, uh, it's very different weather. One day it can be very sunny and shining, and the other day uh, it's it's already cloudy or it's it's it can be thundering very, very hard, and it can be like very big rainstorms. Uh, and we just flew during yeah normal uh, weather condition. Sorry for the light. One second. Okay. Um, so uh, some of the, of the results I already already shared lots of uh, results just uh, just then. But uh, the the main thing we got from there, and we also uh, Anouk already told you that it's uh, free available to a part of our data set, and we flew at different altitudes between 50 until uh, 125 meters, and yeah, we have covered some uh, different lighting conditions. I have some images of those and I will show them in a second. And um, what we also found out is what does the ranger want? And what the ranger wants, he says, is extra eyes in the sky. But it has to be simple, zero effort and two, two hours. And um, Simple means that they don't require not, not a lot of training because they don't have time for that. They they just are limited in 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 uh, 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 what what time they have because they have their other operations to do. So uh, they uh, and that also connects with zero effort uh, because they they it shouldn't really interfere with their current operations. So a little bit of time to put uh, to to launch it, but. Other than that, he doesn't have time to control it all the time. He just wants to say, uh, I want to see there, and then the plane has to fly there. And something we found out there is that all rangers need uh, two hours uh, because, uh, flight time. That's what they say. And why? Well, we asked them all uh, separately, and they all answered, like, because I work for three hours, and, uh, and then I have a break. And that was the reason for these two hours flight time. So that was a very funny thing, but that's, that's what the ranger wants. Um, so here are some of the images. Um, so uh, the, the, you see the, see the rhino quite clear at different heights. It's uh, very doable uh, to also automatically detect it. I think our system is able to detect it at 100 meters. We didn't check for 125 yet, I believe. Um, and yeah, so, so it's very, very doable to de detect uh, rhinos from the air in, in open space, of course, um, with, with, with the RGB camera or with the GoPro. Um, and it's also, it's also doable uh, to de detect humans uh, from, the, from the air uh, at, at lower altitudes. Uh, but uh, like at 100 meters, if you have like, uh, um, the, the kind of clothes uh, rangers are wearing, it's already becoming a real challenge to see it also with a human eye to be able to see them. But big uh, big objects like cars and are very uh, detectable. Um, yes, and then something we also figured out is that the shadow can be very, very uh, useful. So for example, in the left top image, you see a uh, human, a uh, free, free uh, of our team, free team members of ours, and uh, with a shadow, and you see that the shadow makes it make, makes it easier to be able to detect the the the, the human, whereas uh, there is no shadow, you are still able to see it, but less clearly. And uh, actually, um, uh, in the bottom two images, uh, uh, at that moment of the day, the Sun was shining from uh, from the top, so you don't really have a shadow. Um, but you're able to see a shadow still if you're not flying directly above uh, the rhino. So that's really really 
that's that's useful to know so they, that you are able to detect that shadow. Um, um, uh, Kamel, there's... Okay, so are there any questions? Uh, yes. So uh, Mike has another question. Uh, what is the range of how far you can fly or how far you flew for this mission? Uh, Kitsu, can you answer that question for me? Kitsu, are you there? Yeah, Kitsu, you're on. You have uh, Kitsu will come and answer the question with me again. Yes, I'm here. Okay. I can't do anything that I can. <laughs> All right, there you are. So the range of, of flying, uh, we flew within 900 meters of where we, we were standing. Uh, so inside and uh, in range of uh, our RC telemetry and the uh, first person view. We took some long range telemetry with us, but uh, uh, it took us too much time to, to get it to work. So we, uh, we got rid of it. Uh, we, we did some range tests, right? Uh, Kitsu, yeah, can you talk a bit more about that? Um, so all the systems that we, we flew with are, are good up to one kilometer at least. And by heart, I can't remember that much. I think we can go a little bit further without telemetry, and that the first person view camera was uh, limited. And the, the long range RC was also limited. Okay. So up to a kilometer, it's it's verified. Two kilometer, two kilometers. You've verified you can fly up to two kilometers. One, one kilometer. One. one kilometer. Okay. Have you guys tried a? Did you try a directional um, antenna? Yes. Uh, we were getting, uh, we used the direction antenna for our uh, uh, first person view camera, but we were getting uh, very bad images. Okay. But that's probably not because of the, uh, the, uh, the link, but because of the camera was failing us. Okay. So we, I can't tell you if, if we can get, uh, of course it helps, we, we noticed that, but I'm not sure how far we can get with it. Okay. All right. And here's a, another question from Astrid. Uh, would it be possible to train the system to detect several species in the same flight? And I'm assuming that's a question for Anouk. Uh, probably. Uh, several species as in different types of rhinos or rhinos compared to giraffes? Uh, I'm going to assume rhinos compared to giraffes. Yeah, uh, that's possible. That's what we're working on at the moment. At this point, our detector is a general object detector, so it will just detect every single object. Um, but we're working on the classifier that will do that. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, and there's a question for Prashant. Is it necessary to, to give the rangers RFID? Can they be provided with smart devices with GPS? Is this a Kitso question? <laughs> Maybe I'm still trying to figure out what what he exactly means. I think what uh, he means is like I think one of the things that Kamel was talking about, which is definitely a concern uh, with corruption, right? And that's one of the things yeah. that we're facing um, as well for Kruger is can we put RFID tags on the Rangers? Yes. Can you put um, RFID tags on their weapons on their vehicles? So then that way you know where the team that belongs to the parks is located at all times so the aircraft can do that um so i think that's where he was going with his question mm -hmm. is it necessary okay. to give the rangers rfid tags and can they be provided with smart devices with gps you want to do it uh, kito yeah sure <laughs> um i think it's, it's certainly possible and um, if it's necessary to do to counter the, the the possibility of being corrupt, maybe. Uh, it might actually also be useful for the rangers in, in, in doing their job as well. If they know where their colleagues are, they might mm -hmm. have a better overview of what they can do and where they, sh they should be. But the main thing about, um, about the corruption is that, that you create the, a sort of social pressure that you, that you are being checked or watched, that, you, uh, that if you do something wrong, that they know they can find you. At this point, if uh, one ranger watches a certain field, then he is responsible for that field. And he can't be responsible for what he doesn't see. The drone could give him uh, a larger area to see. But if we can't check 
what he sees with that drone. He can use the drone for, for other reasons and other purposes. If we can check, then we still can say to the ranger, well, this is uh, something happened here. You saw it with the, this drone, or maybe this happened three times already with you. What are you doing? And, and this principle is, is why they need to, to have the, this, the, the data at two places. Uh, one at the ranger's hand and at some other point where, you, uh, where the head of security can see it. Thanks, Kitso. Steve, I, I need just, to... <clears throat> I must just add in a, a point here. Um, a little while ago, they attempted to uh, put transponders into rifle barrels, so uh, sorry, rifle butts, so that um, they would know who has which one and where they went and all the rest of it. And there was a huge uh, um, sort of, uh, I won't say upset, but the 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 uh, union got involved and uh, the result was that uh, those sorts of tracking devices were removed. Um, we have to bear in mind that there's a huge social issue with tracking and you know, those of us that are sort of very pro, um, uh, uh, you know, wildlife and that sort of thing, sort of say, well, why do you, why, why do you oppose it? And we kind of wonder sometimes if it's if it's part of the union saying, yeah, well, we don't want people spying on our members and telling them they're not doing their job, so we'll oppose anything like that. And we also don't want, um, we don't want our, our members being accused of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So there's a huge sort of social issue around these sort of tracking devices which we just need to be aware of. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, uh, Steve, but um, I, I think the, the, the thing we were, were uh, proposing is that, that, that there should be a, a location or that the, that the video of the, of the drone, so wherever it is. Oh yeah, no, no, that, that obviously, that, that would have the exact location. Yeah, no problem yeah. there. But yes, if we're gonna track uh, our rangers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, it's it's a it's a hard decision because yeah, you're you're giving up some of your privacy, of course. It's a difficult uh, thing altogether because uh, that's also what they say. If if they have a ranger on that lookout uh, and and he he radios in something that happens, the head of security is going to trust that guy. He he has to and he will and he does, but. At the same time, he is always afraid that uh, some of them might might uh, might change their mind if if uh, if they get too much money offered. So it's a very delicate line between you have to trust them because your your safety is dependent on it, and on the other side, uh, one year salary for just showing where a rhino is 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 always on 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 alert. So, so a drone that that's, uh, can help uh, the, the, the head also to check whether things are really true or to give him a, more information would really help him, I think. Definitely, definitely. Are there more uh, questions? Yeah, there's one question about um, is the, is the dr camera capable enough to zoom in on the poacher to make some kind of facial ID for later um, possibility? So at the moment we don't have a camera that can zoom that way so we have just a GoPro uh, that's that's the images you're seeing now uh, but that's definitely something uh, they want. Maybe uh, Kitsu you had some ideas about this right? Yeah, the rangers always say that if they see an image, they, they want uh, to zoom in and, and, and check what kind of clothing they're wearing, what color, mm -hmm. if they're carrying a weapon. Uh, face idea, maybe they also said it, but they uh, might, might not have to. So mm -hmm. there's always, uh, you see something and you want more. So zooming is one of the ways to, to actually achieve that. Uh, if it's really necessary, I'm not sure. Uh, we should consider it. But uh, it, it always also limits or, or puts more constraints on what you take, carry with you and, and what you're using. Maybe mm -hmm. it's enough to, to fly at one altitude to, to find something and if you want more, fly at a lower altitude again. Maybe. Thank you, Kitsa. Thanks, Kitsa. Um, all right, guys, we've 
we've reached our time here. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to to ask. But I thought your presentation was great, and the work that you guys are doing is super duper awesome. I mean, taking a trip all the way out to South Africa to test your system—that's definitely phenomenal that you guys did that. And I'm really, you know, yeah. glad that you you had that experience, and now you have a more of a personal connection as well. Whereas before, you know, you knew about the aircraft, but now you also know about what the people on the ground are dealing with, as well as the the wildlife that we are looking to protect as well. So I, I really thank you guys for all your effort and your time that you put into such an amazing project. So thank you. And this wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. And I would like to thank Lolo especially because they hosted us during those those two weeks and they gave all their support and uh, yeah it was it was very nice and without them we, we wouldn't be there uh, be, and we wouldn't be able to test our system in in South Africa so we were very thankful uh, to them um, and I have one last nice picture oh. and uh, that's uh, of hippos uh, in the water we flew also next to hippos oh wow so. that's a great one <laughs> wow that's a good one <laughs> um, so this, uh, so I guess the, the the white light on the right hand side, Kamel, was that just? That's, that's the plane. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, all right. Wow, that's kind of really a cool picture. They're just sunbathing. And uh, it's very nice uh, to we also noticed that uh, you can see quite fruity water. So you, uh, other things, yeah. They, they, they touched upon me, it's like that you can count hippos in, in the rivers. Uh, mm. That would be really, really nice to have. Very good. Camille? <clears throat> yes, Steve. Can I ask you one qu one final question? For sure. In, <laughs> in terms of the competition and the point scoring of the competition, how do you think you would have done? Oh. Not 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 your future um, uh, uh, developments, but currently, how would you have done? Um, I'm not sure. We didn't see check the the, the scoring table lately, so I can't say that uh, <laughs> on top of my head. <laughs> I think not that much because a lot of things we sort of hacked together to to test different things of uh, of our assumption of our different assumptions. So there's no complete autonomous flight. There's no live inter interaction with the detections. But uh, for now, it's, it's all right because we can still answer these questions, but even if it's not live. Of course, everything has to be live to actually use it. But, yes, uh, yes. Before you make something that, that, is, that, uh, that in the end is not wanted or not needed anyway, uh, let's test it first. Right. So, right. would you say that the extra time for the counter poaching games is a good thing then. <laughs> <laughs> There's two sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. I think you guys are doing a phenomenal job. You're definitely, um, I would have to say my personal opinion, uh, leading edge of uh, the technology that you're creating. So um, I think you're doing pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for Thank hosting you. us. Doing well. And, uh, Very well. Yes. For everyone, take a look at our data set. And if you like it and you have a data set as well, please share, share it. We can all benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're really open uh, to collaborate on uh, data sharing for for uh, for uh, automatic detection of, uh, of interesting objects. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, guys, for a wonderful webinar. This was very helpful. Um, I'll try to have the recording uh, by tomorrow for those of us that, those are the ones that missed it. Um, Michael said, thanks a lot. Great progress. Right. Thank you. All right, thank you, Astrid. Thanks, good night. All right, thanks, guys. You have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.